and welcome to Ye Old Bestsellers Book Club, where I am taking a look at some of America's earliest bestselling novels as reported by The Bookman, a magazine of the 1890s. Today we are reading A Houseboat on the Sticks by John Kendrick Bangs, published in 1896, or, by its full title, A Houseboat on the Sticks being some account of the divers' doings of the Associated Shades, because the long titles are fun, I guess. Also, that's divers spelled like scuba divers, not diverse, like a diverse group. I had to go and look something up before I even made it through the title. Divers, with no e at the end, is basically an outdated word for many. J.K. Bangs was a very prolific writer, with diverse publications over his lifetime. He wrote mostly humor, and Houseboat is in that category. He also did a lot of writing and editing for various magazines throughout the years. Now, Houseboat is a little different than other books that I've done so far because it's not really a standard novel format. It's a series of connected vignettes, and each chapter has little to no impact on any other, which is a style of book I have been specifically avoiding. I don't think it'll work very well for this format, but I picked this one by accident, and so we're just going to roll with it. So... The first chapter begins, quote, Karen, the ferryman of renown, was cruising slowly along the sticks one pleasant Friday morning not long ago, and as he paddled idly on, he chuckled mildly to himself as he thought of the monopoly in ferriage which in the course of years he had managed to build up. And then in the middle of a verbal monologue about how great it is to be the only ferryman on this river in the afterlife of Hades, he rounds a corner and sees another boat on his river. Quote, "'Blow me for a landlubber if I like that,' he said in a hardly audible whisper, "'and shiver my timbers if I don't find out what she's there for.'" It's a pretty big, fancy boat, one might say a houseboat. He climbs on board and gets worried because it's much nicer than his boat, but he does think to himself that, should it put him out of business, he has saved enough money to live in comfort for all of his days. And I think to myself, "'You are immortal, sir, and in the underworld.'" Why do you need money? And if you do, how could you never run out of it unless you keep earning more? He leaves and later passes the boat again while ferrying a group of passengers. This time, there is a party on board, and someone calls out to Karen, telling him that some of the people in charge of this boat would like to speak to him. Apparently, the dead dudes in charge of this boat want Karen to be their janitor, by which they seem to mean dude who takes care of all boat-related logistics, because he is the underworld's best boat guy. He agrees, after negotiating for his salary and Saturdays off, and says he is happy to start working immediately, by which he means taking the day off, because it is Saturday. We hardly see Karen again for the entire novel. Chapter 2, Shakespeare comes to the houseboat party and flips a coin to decide which room to go to, and then he does the opposite, because apparently he always does that as a fuck you to the fates, which apparently the fates think is hilarious, because they know about it and they just will the coin to fall opposite to whatever it otherwise would, so he does what they want anyway. Shakespeare goes to play billiards with ancient Roman Emperor Nero and Samuel Johnson, who's a very well-known figure in the literary world from the 18th century and one of the most consistently present characters in the book. They quip at each other a bit, accuse Nero's violin playing as being bad enough to literally kill people, to which Nero ribs Shakespeare about not being the real writer of Othello. This was a big talking point during the 19th century, especially. People on the Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare side of things often claim that there were doubts decades, even centuries before then. People on the Shakespeare is legitimate side generally insist that no, the fake author theories originated in the 19th century. This is a massive, complicated argument that could be and has been discussed for hours, and I don't really have the qualifications to participate, but it was a theory hotly debated in the 1800s whether or not it originated there, which is why it's coming up in this book. A lot of the doubt at least started from a belief that Shakespeare was not educated or refined enough to write the stories and situations that he did in the way that he did, then leading to people claiming that there just wasn't enough evidence definitively proving that Shakespeare was the author, and Francis Bacon, a highly educated and higher class man, was the top alternate author candidate of the time, although there were and are many other names thrown around, sometimes several at once, with suggestions that Shakespeare may have been the pen name for a collaborative group of writers. Mainstream Shakespeare scholarship seems to consider these theories fairly illegitimate, kind of a conspiracy theory, and 
I would dare venture to say that yeah, it kind of seems that way, yeah, but who am I to judge? In narrative, Shakespeare says, quote, I'm getting tired of this idiotic talk about not having written my own works. There's one thing about Nero's music that I've never said because I haven't wanted to hurt his feelings. But since he has chosen to cast aspersions upon my honesty, I haven't any hesitation in saying it now. I believe it was one of his fiddlings that sent nature into convulsions and caused the destruction of Pompeii, so there. Put that on your music rack and fiddle it, my little emperor. Then Nero spears Shakespeare through the heart with a pool cue. Luckily, he's already dead, so it doesn't matter, and no one cares. They discuss Shakespeare's work some more. It's blatantly stated that he actually didn't write Hamlet, among others. Lord Francis Bacon did. Bacon says that Shakespeare did literally write Hamlet, but he was only writing down what Bacon dictated to him. Though that is countered as unbelievable, because having seen Shakespeare's autographs, he has villainously bad handwriting, and no one in their right mind would have him take dictation. This whole chapter is literally just, everyone is a dick to Shakespeare. Chapter 3, George Washington's birthday party. Why dead people would celebrate their birthdays, I'm not really sure, but it raises some logistical questions. Because at this party is being served, quote, the shades of countless canvasback ducks, terrapin, and sheep, cooked by no less a person than Brillet Saverin in the hottest oven he could find. Now, Shade, thus far, has referred to all of the dead guys who are walking around. As far as I can tell, it means a living, or I guess unliving, resident of Hades, who are immortal. Except these are the shades of animals, and they are being cooked. So are we eating the immortal souls of real dead animals? And if so, what happens to them then? And if you can cook and eat the dead, are they truly immortal? If Shakespeare can take a pool cue to the chest that implies that the immortal dead cannot be injured, but then how would you eat them? Later, someone is described as eating the shade of an almond. Do almonds have immortal souls? There's also a journalist present. Apparently Hades does have its own gossip columns. Christopher Columbus is present at Washington's birthday party, and he says, regarding the U.S., that, quote, Washington is the father of his country, and I am not. I only discovered the orphan. I knew the country before it had a father or a mother. There wasn't anybody who was willing to be even a sister to it when I knew it. Yet no one cared about this land at all. You're right. No one was there before you. There was, there was nothing going on. There was nothing going on. Sure. We then get a ramble from Diogenes, Greek philosopher from the BC years, about jealousy and the fact that he wasn't jealous of people living in brownstone front houses, even though he was living out of a tub. And yeah, you wouldn't have been, because that is a style of house built in mostly 19th century America, not ancient Greece. There would have been no brownstone front houses for you to be jealous of. This is a thing that's going to come up a lot in this book. Everybody feels like just some dude from the 1800s America slash UK, maybe. How they talk, what technology they make reference to, there is almost no hint that these people are from a wide, diverse spread of history, which if you are writing a book based on the idea of people from across history hanging out, you would think you would want to play with their different perspectives, maybe, but no, there were brownstone houses in ancient Greece, apparently. Maybe that's the joke, I don't know. Also, Shakespeare is apparently smuggling autographs into the world of the living to sell for $1,000 a piece, because that is a thing, I guess, that you can do. We also have an appearance by Baron Munchausen, which is impressive, given that he's not a real person. He is based on a real person, but I don't think that's who's sitting at this dinner table. He wouldn't be the only fictional character who shows up. And I guess this is all taking place in Hades, with associated mythological figures like Karen. That's also not a real person. But that one makes sense. Your setting is the land of the dead, so fictional figures associated with the land of the dead would be present. I wouldn't even necessarily be surprised if figures from other mythologies showed up. But there is a difference between that and a fictional character from, like, a century ago is present in the land of the dead. And once again, I am way overthinking the implications that this has on the internal workings of this universe. Because what we've learned is that making someone up in the land of the living can lead to that fake person being present in the afterlife. 
and things from the afterlife can be transported to the land of the living, like Shakespeare's autographs. So you could have a legitimate autograph from the genuine ghost of a fictional character. Somehow that part still makes more sense to me than ghost almonds. Baron Munchausen, by the way, is around to tell the story of the time that he totally, legitimately, no embellishments, this genuinely happened, used a pearl that he found as a bullet to shoot 68 ducks in one shot after waiting in a lake for a week and six days for those 68 ducks to line up in single file, which he had done the math to calculate would definitely happen within two weeks. And he also did the math to calculate the exact force it would take for the bullet to only pass halfway through the 68th bird so that he could keep the somehow unharmed pearl at the end. Worth noting, the entire joke of Baron Munchausen as a character, his reason for existing is that he claims to have done absurd, obviously fake, incredible feats of heroism or skill or whimsy. I was not familiar, and so this joke probably didn't land the way it was meant to, but it did make things feel amusingly surreal, so I almost feel like that was a good thing. Chapter 4, Dead Guys Insult Each Other More, Hamlet, the man, walks in, also not a real person. He was based on a guy who was probably also not a real person. He and Yorick are both annoyed at the inaccuracies in Shakespeare's play compared to their real lives. I... Um, how, how does that work? How do you make up a man, weave him into existence with your words, have him then appear for real in the afterlife to tell you that you were wrong about who he was? When did you experience life, Hamlet? Where do your memories of true existence come from, if not the mind of your creator? I know this is just funny haha -ha jokes land, and nothing is supposed to make sense, and the fact that the fiction was wrong is literally the joke, but I can't not think about this. Also, someone insults Shakespeare again. And someone references a Kodak picture, which surprised me that that would be a term. I didn't know Kodak as a brand went back that far. Uh, this would actually be around the time that Kodak was selling a style of cameras that helped make amateur photography a lot more accessible to a lot more people, so I guess it makes sense that Kodak picture would be a phrase, but it wasn't known to me. Hamlet and Shakespeare are both just aghast at the state of Hamlet performances in the modern day, and they want a way to get back at the people responsible, but they don't know how until Hamlet suggests that Shakespeare write him into a play that he can perform in as a lead, in which the main character of bad modern Hamlet actor is dropped into a tank, shaved with a buzzsaw, has his brain knocked down into his lungs, is sent over Niagara Falls, and then is guillotined just after swallowing a quart of prussic acid and a spoonful of powdered glass. That is very aggressive, Mr. Hamlet. Chapter 5, the Associated Shades discuss whether or not the houseboat should be given a designated poet's corner. This is wanted both by some poets and also by people who are tired of having to hang out with poets, who are doing things like lying over five chairs simultaneously in the library and writing poetry on the billiard table in chalk. Also, Demosthenes is here putting rocks in his mouth to speak more clearly. He's an ancient Greek dude said to have become a very skilled public speaker after treating his own speech impediment partially by putting rocks in his mouth so that he would have to super overcompensate to enunciate around the rocks. And then when he took them out, through that practice, he was able to speak more clearly. Him performing this speech therapy centuries into his afterlife and during casual conversation it makes no sense, which, yes, I know, is this book, but still, it's not even rocks in this scene, it's just rock. There's at least three reasons why this is nonsensical, and that's not even counting just the concept of shoving rocks in your mouth. Anyways, Confucius suggests, quote, can't we adopt a house rule that poets must not be inspired between the hours of 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. or in the evening after 8? That any poet discovered using more than five armchairs in the composition of a quatrain will be charged two obli an hour for each chair in excess of that number. And that the billiard marker shall be required to charge a premium of three times the ordinary fee for tables used by versifiers in lieu of writing pads. This chapter is just People Hate Poets, which is at least a slight variation from the previous chapters of People Hate Shakespeare. Chapter 6, Darwin is reading an asbestos copy 
of the London Times. Now, asbestos was used in practically everything, it seems like, for a minute there, but not widely in paper products. Maybe as a novelty? I don't know if this is a Hades thing, or an author thought this was fancy thing. You know, the underworld. We have diamond-studded chopsticks and newspapers made of poison that they didn't know was poison until the 1900s. Anyways, this chapter is about talking monkeys, a thing that exists, I guess. It's hard to tell where the line is in this book between ridiculous thing that actually exists in this fantasy version of the world and ridiculous thing that the characters have made up entirely. And I know I'm taking this more seriously than I'm supposed to, but I can't not do that. But there is an article in the Asbestos newspaper about the discovery of talking monkeys, and everyone's response is basically just, yeah, that's cool, but I knew about it already. And Baron Munchausen claims that he, in fact, learned to speak monkey once upon a time, but he couldn't get the accent quite right because he didn't have a tail. This conversation turns to a debate on the Darwin says man is descended from monkey thing, to which Munchausen says that he believes before the flood, like the Noah's Ark flood, all men had tails, including Noah and his family, because a third arm is the only way that they could have managed to build the ark as quickly as they did. But people don't have tails now, because maybe Noah and the gang overworked them, or got them caught in a door, or otherwise lost them. Quote, men lose their hair and their teeth, why might not a man lose a tail? As though losing your teeth means that your descendants don't get to have any? Uh-huh. Johnson has a slightly different theory, that Adam himself was a monkey, and that he and Eve didn't eat any forbidden fruit, but in fact swung by their tails from a forbidden tree, and that the serpent of the story was in fact the tails, and as punishment for their swinging, they lost their tails, and quote, the tail itself was compelled to work for a living and do its own walking, and the snakes of present day, he believes, quote, to be the missing tails of men, Somewhere in the world is a tale for every man and woman and child. The abhorrence that man has for snakes is directly attributable to his abhorrence for all things which have deprived him of something that is good. This is made all the weirder by the fact that Adam himself is also a member of this club, as is Noah, actually. They have met the man, monkey. Don't know if they think that monkeys just look exactly like people, but with tails I feel like you would be able to tell if they had been monkeys, but okay. Chapter 7, the boys discuss whether they should have a ladies' day, where they let women aboard their fun boat. Confucius, in particular, is not happy. He thinks clubs should exist purely as a way for men to escape their wives, and reveals that while he was married when alive, he has no idea what even happened to her, since he treats her death as divorce, and he wants nothing to do with her. Yet he also seems to think that it is completely nonsensical that Queen Elizabeth held, quote, absolute sway over men, yet lived and died an old maid. And, dude, you clearly don't appreciate women's company. I don't know why you can't fathom that the opinion might sometimes go the other way around. They then debate the logistics, like who should be invited, with concerns like, quote, it would hardly be a pleasing spectacle for Catherine of Aragon to see Henry running his legs off getting cream and cakes for Anne Boleyn. Nor would Anne like it much if, on the other hand, Henry chose to behave like a gentleman and a husband to Jane Seymour or Catherine Parr. I think if members themselves are to send out the invitations, they should each be limited to two cards, with the express understanding that no member shall be permitted to invite more than one wife. I don't think Henry VIII's wives' main problem would be each other, so much as Henry, but what do I know? Chapter 8 is mostly the shades talking about how it's kind of boring to be dead. The biggest thing I took away from this chapter is confusion, again, about how the world's rules work, with the implication that they can choose their clothes based on memories, and can even summon food and drink based on memory, and cigars, which... We had, like, a full page earlier dedicated to explaining the exact mechanics of their fancy pants smoking room and how the amount that they smoke is measured so that they can be precisely charged for it. And if memory is what conjures things you can consume, why are you paying for tobacco? There was a cook earlier using an oven. How does that work if he can just imagine food? 
Chapter 9, poets Homer and Robert Burns discuss how sad it is that while a poet's work can be immortal, a cook's cannot. And that's sad. And that made sense until it becomes clear that their issue is not that food is temporary in a way that words aren't, but that cooks don't sign their work, as though attaching a name tag to a piece of ham will make the meal immortal. Phidias, an ancient Greek sculptor, enters and is annoyed that sculptors of today are desecrating his grand art form by making sculptures out of butter. The other two convince him that it's okay, actually, because it means that all of the bad art will melt eventually. Chapter 10, the club has a storyteller's night, where people get up on stage and read for the crowd. It doesn't go well, Napoleon and the Duke of Wellington get so bored that they start a fight. Munchausen tries to tell a story about an encounter that he totally legitimately had with the whale from the Jonah and the Whale story, but then Jonah claims that he has sole copyright ownership of that whale and it cannot be used in any other stories, so the Baron is stopped, and shortly after, the chapter just cuts off because several characters get annoyed and leave the room, and one of those characters is apparently the one that the book's unidentified narrator gets all of his information from regarding what happens on the houseboat, so without him present, the narrator has no idea how Storyteller's Night ended. Chapter 11. Circus Man P.T. Barnum has a bone to pick with Noah, of Ark fame, over the animals that he chose to save or not save because he thinks dinosaurs would have made banging circus animals, and he is upset that they all died. Adam and Noah both think that this would have been a bad idea because dinosaurs are too big and they eat too much and they're too mischievous. And apparently iguanodons caused a lot of problems in Eden. And one of Noah's kids had a creosaurus named Fido who kept mysteriously disappearing their cows. Barnum insists that dinosaurs would have made him a fortune. Chapter 12, last one, Queen Elizabeth, Ophelia, and Socrates' wife Xanthope are walking and talking about the dangers of wearing skirts on bicycles when their path passes by the houseboat, and they discuss how they've never been allowed on board. Ladies' Day still hasn't happened. The boat seems weirdly quiet, kind of closed up, no one's visible watching it, so they decide to sneak on board and find it empty, except for a billiard room attendant who tells them to leave. They say no, and ask where all of the club members are. Apparently they are off on shore somewhere watching a prize fight between Samson and Goliath. It had to be on shore so that they could bet on it, which isn't allowed on the boat. The ladies telephone some friends about the empty boat and soon have a whole gaggle of famous dead women on board. They call a meeting, elect themselves members of the houseboat, Cleopatra, their president, the billiard room attendant replacing Karen as janitor, and they kick all of the men out of the club for unbecoming behavior. Free now to explore their new party boat, they don't even notice that night soon comes upon them, and in the night is a danger. Specifically the pirate Captain Kidd and a band of fellows in a rowboat. Kidd is mad that he wasn't admitted to the club. Quote, I may be a pirate, he cried when he heard what the club had done, but I have feelings, and the associated shades will repent their action. So the pirates sneak on board the boat and make off with it, along with all of the women. The narrator doesn't know what has become of them, since the boat still hasn't been recovered. Quote, the men of Hades were cast into a gloom from which there seems to be no relief. Socrates alone was unaffected. They'll come back some day, so why repine? I'll never lose my Xanthope, permanently, that is. I know that, for I am a philosopher, and I know there is no such thing as luck. What does that mean, Mr. Socrates? How does the non-existence of luck have any bearing on your wife being kidnapped by pirates? The end. That is the end. There is a sequel to this book, so it's not a permanent cliffhanger, but it was a very jarring shift because it's the only chapter in the entire book where anything happens. Maybe chapter one, two, but otherwise it's all just butter sculpture and poetry and dinosaur monkey debates and insulting Shakespeare mostly insulting Shakespeare, and suddenly just, then everyone was kidnapped by pirates. The end. I, I wasn't expecting plot. There isn't a review that I could find for Houseboat in The Bookman or otherwise from way back when, so I guess I'm left to do that myself, which I don't appreciate. I think it was funny. It was bizarre and surreal and had some good witty dialogue. I think a lot of the jokes rely on you being familiar with the historical figures who are present, and sometimes I wasn't, and that made things land weirdly, but that's certainly not the book's problem. 
I think it was kind of distracting just how overwhelmingly every single character acts like basically the same dude wearing a slightly different costume. I don't think anyone felt even slightly like they had been born in another era. I think that's especially common in, like, comedies. Historical characters will use a modern voice. That still happens. It isn't inherently bad. But I was expecting them to at least pretend sometimes to have lived in another time period. I also cannot get over the incomprehensible logic of the world building. This isn't a criticism. It's just the only thing I'm left thinking about. At one point, they toss bread to the, quote, shade of a hungry dog that stood yelping on the riverbank. Does every dead dog go to Hades? Why is he hungry? They said at one point that you can just imagine food. So can the dog not do that? But then also at a different point, food was being cooked in an oven, which implies a physical process. So were the ingredients imagined and then cooked? I mean, surely they weren't farmed. Surely the butter on the piece of bread that they gave that dog didn't come from the spectral teat of a phantom cow. Surely an immortal soul doesn't lactate. If the ghosts eat, do they have to expel waste later? I'm sorry, this is what happens, I guess, if I can't just piggyback off of someone else's real review. I think I'm done. This read-through was probably shorter, this book was shorter, and honestly not ideal to be recapping this way. It wasn't a great pick for this, because the point is it's humor, and a lot of that is probably lost when it's removed from its original delivery. But in case you have no interest in reading it yourself, now you know that snakes are just the monkey tails that your sinful humanity has separated from you, and that's important. I think. So, I'll catch you next time, I hope, and in the meantime, this podcast has an Instagram and a Twitter, both at yobpod, Y-O-B-B-P-O-D. Have a wonderful day, and as a piece of life advice from the past, don't be a poet, no one will like you. (laughs) 